we are gonna now start the first panel of the day um it is a incredibly powerful one because it's really going to talk about how we understand eco-anxiety climate distress environmental grief solastalgia and more um i think i mentioned it earlier but i'm going to say it again professor susan clayton <laughs> um is the is the moderator for that session uh susan i hope you're on uh let me see, Is are all the panelists in place? Yes, wonderful. Hi, Susan. So um, Susan is the professor of psychology at the College of Worcester in Ohio. Her research examines people's relationships with natural environment, how it's socially constructed and how a healthy relationship with nature can be promoted. Perfect segue from Jackie's talk and Jackie's last comment. She has written about the effects of climate change on mental health. She developed a scale to assess climate anxiety that we at LOCA have used um, that I urge you to check out because it's been so helpful to unpack what climate anxiety looks like in different sub identity groups, right? Um, she is author and editor of six books, including Identity and Natural Environment, Conservation Psychology, and Psychology and Climate Change. Um, she's a fellow at the American Psychological Association, and I'm thrilled to say she was the, one of the lead authors for the sixth assessment report on the IPCC's um, report on climate change. That is the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the report that came out, um, which really is telling because I think even 10 years ago, this five years ago, this was unimaginable that climate and psychology would come together and just it would be so matter of fact that and necessary, right, that these two fields are coming together. Um, Susan, welcome. Thank you so much for being here and for moderating the session. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Dakila. It's uh, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be with you this morning, part of this panel, and also just to contribute to the wonderful work that the LOCA initiative is doing. Um, as Dakila just said, this is a panel that is really focused on different emotional responses to climate change, um, understanding eco-anxiety, climate distress, environmental grief, and essentially so on. And so what we really want to do is give some different um, perspectives on the range of emotions that people are experiencing. Um, we have three speakers and each one will give their remarks for about 15 or 20 minutes with maybe a couple of questions after each one, and then we'll have time at the end for a more general conversation and discussion. And I certainly hope people will submit questions using the Q&A. Um, our first speaker this morning will be Dr. Panu Pikala. Um, Panu is a adjunct professor of environmental theology at the University of Helsinki and a widely cited specialist in research on eco-emotions. He has developed practical methods for eco-emotion work and he leads workshops often in collaboration with artists or educators, a true interdisciplinarian, and has served as an advisor for many practical projects around eco-emotions, especially in Finland. He's the author of several books in Finnish, and he has received many awards for his work with eco-anxiety. Uh, you may also wanna check out his podcast on climate change and happiness, which he co-leads with environmental psychologist, Thomas Doherty. And, um, both of whom I'm very pleased to have met and worked with in the past. So I'm looking forward to Panu's comments. Panu, over to you. Thank you very much, Susan, and warm thanks for the organizers for all the fabulous work in putting this conference together. And thanks for inviting me. Good evening from Helsinki, Finland. It's 6 p.m. in, in Hel Helsinki, a sunny late autumn, autumn day. Uh, today, I'm going to speak about some comments on eco-anxiety and environmental emotions. So what I'm planning to do has two steps. First, there's going to be a few visuals and recap of some research, a kind of greatest hits of my own research type of thing. And I know that this is going to be recorded on YouTube. So I'll just briefly go through some visuals. And those of you who are interested can then use the recording to remind yourself of them and po possibly search for more information. 
a sort of special thing that I want to do today is talk a bit more in depth about ecological grief and its close connections with eco anxiety. I know that grief was yesterday the special emotion theme of this conference, but it's so prominent part of the affective landscape where we are living that I want to spend some time with it. And it's also closely related to forthcoming and ongoing research of, of mine. But starting with the visuals and recap of research, what eco anxiety? Here are some aspects of what people may mean with the word anxiety. I did a larger uh, article, Anxiety and the Ecological Crisis, about this, but this grab is actually from an environmental education themed article called Eco Anxiety and Environmental Education. So there's anxiety as an emotion, more about that soon in the strict sense, a bodily or body mindly reaction. There may be strong anxiety symptoms or anxiety sensitivity, for example. There may be anxiety due to repressed emotions. There may be existential anxiety. So it's quite important to pay attention to what various people are meaning when they use the word anxiety. And this has, of course, led to some confusion uh, about eco-anxiety and climate anxiety. My own take on this as an interdisciplinary researcher is that we have all kinds of eco-anxiety uh, when these various aspects uh, are, are explored. A bit more philosophical and emotion research oriented discussion about this is a relatively recent article by philosopher Charlie Kurtz and, and me called Eco Anxiety, what it is and why it matters uh, freely online as I try to get all my research to be. And here's a quote from Ter. The authors, that means us, uh, also find that a specific form of eco anxiety called practical eco anxiety can be a deeply valuable emotional response to threats like climate change. When experienced at the right time and to the right extent, roughly so, practical eco anxiety not only reflects well on one's moral character, but can also help advance individual and planetary well being. So we are not saying that all eco-anxiety is practical eco-anxiety. Eco-anxiety can also manifest in terrible distress, for example. But at its core, we find this emotion, practical eco-anxiety, which is very valuable and can be very adaptive and important. As for other eco-emotions, here's a small and quite simple emotion chart or visual that I did some time ago, a lot more of emotion words could be mentioned. And actually, a group of people is right now doing an adaptation of emotion scholar Robert Blutschik's feel of emotions uh, into the uh, realm of climate emotions. So more visuals are, are, are coming. Uh, more information about this array of various ecological emotions and climate emotions can be found in this article, also freely available on online. There's a long table too about many kinds of emotion and feeling words, uh, which can be related to various ecological and socio-ecological issues. And as Susan mentioned, we do have the podcast with environmental psychologist Thomas Doherty, where we very often discuss especially climate related emotions and feelings, but also more broadly ecological emotions significantly related to various kinds of ecological issues. And then as the final part of the recap, and sorry to display so much text and visuals here, but I wanted to give you a visual memory of this. This is a um, the result of a long research process about conceptualizing a process model of eco-anxiety and ecological grief. The aim was to make a model which would be nuanced enough, so not simple stages, but more dynamic, but also to keep it simple enough. And I hope that this may be useful for people. I will not now have time to go through this. I'll just mention that in the middle, there is this metaphase called coping and changing with three dimensions. Action at the service of life can be many kinds of things. Grieving, including other emotional engagement and distancing, including both self-care and avoidance. And these are surrounded by the potential for stronger anxiety and depression. 
And the idea in the process model is that based on interdisciplinary literature, we need all these three dimensions. And if we only practice one of them, then the threat of stronger anxiety and depression becomes more intense. And there can be justice issues in relation to all these three dimensions. It's terrible for people if they don't have possibilities for efficacy and empowerment, for example. It's also terrible if there's no community support for grieving. And there's big issues if there's no time for rest and also uh, taking some distance from the very uh, troublesome facts of reality. But I'll not go more deeply into the process model now, but instead I'll devote uh, the latter half of the time I have here to uh, discussing grieving. And this is part of an ongoing research process, and it also builds on the process model where I'm arguing that eco-anxiety and ecological grief are closely intertwined. To put it positively, one could say that anxiety helps us to react to threats, while grief and sadness help us But what I'm doing now in this paper, which will soon go into peer review, is um, now, my internet connection says, says that it's unstable, but hopefully you can still hear, hear what I'm saying. So what I'm doing in this forthcoming work is adapting theories of grief and bereavement into ecological grief and loss. So discussing various types of loss and various types of grief. These are not exactly the same, and it's sometimes important to do this distinction. Uh, not all losses engender the same kind of grief in and different people. So we need understanding of nuances and contextual differences. And sometimes the results of various grief and bereavement research researches can help us to make more sense of our ecological emotions and feelings. That may help us in self-care and in designing community care. And it can also be related to ethics and morals, um, because it's very important to pay attention that some very significant forms of ecological grief can be difficult to notice. This continues the work of Ashley Kunsolo and others. And justice issues are very prevalent here. Many people are already losing much more than others. Some takeaways of this forthcoming and ongoing research. First, starting with of loss. One distinction in grief research is between tangible and intangible losses. So tangible means something that is easy to see and grasp, and intangible means something which can be very invisible and not easy to recognize. And a same loss can have both kinds of aspects. For example, if a forest nearby is cut down, that is a tangible thing happening, but because people's values and attachments are different, some people will feel it as a loss, while others may feel it as an economic gain, for example. And then people may have all kinds of uh, connections, attachments uh, and values, which give much value and importance to that particular forest. So there may be intangible aspects of people's ecological loss experiences, which are not easily, easily seen, and these need attention. The, this distinction from grief research, I think, can help sometimes in that. Ambiguous loss means losses which are somehow uncertain. There may be, for example, psychological presence but physical absence. A classic example in grief research is soldiers missing in action. There is grief, there is loss, but there's also strong uncertainty that whether the person is finally lost. And many scholars have already observed that ecological grief includes often aspects of ambiguous loss. And in climate-related changes often are so that 
things statistically change, but still there may be some instances where they remain. This is the case with winters in Finland, for example. We have lost lots of snow and winters, but then sometimes we get lots of snow, uh, referring to winter grief, for example. Non-finite loss is a framework in grief research which focuses on those kinds of losses which are persistent and they have an ongoing presence. And of course, that then results in many things. It's quite different to live with a continuing loss than than just to uh, encounter a loss which has more finality in it. Life world loss is a term I'm using here for quite holistic losses where whole life worlds and ways of being on earth are felt to be changing or lost. And this is something encountered, for example, in among indigenous people, when the whole land and lifestyle is changed because of many kinds of justice issues, including ecological changes. So these kinds of things um, I'm, I'm drawing from theories of loss and grief and bereavement and then applying them to ecological context. And finally, then related to forms of grief, and disenfranchised grief means those kinds of grief which are not given social recognition or social support. And there's different varieties of these also. Anticipatory grief is grief happening in advance, but I think it's important to realize that we are going through complex working through of ongoing changes which are estimated to be more final in the future. So instead of just talking about anticipatory grief, I think we need to uh, wrestle with transitional grief and these changes which are partly already happening and which are estimated to be more final in the future. Uh, a framework from grief research, which I found very fascinating and useful, is called chronic sorrow. It's not the same as chronic grief. Terminology can be quite confusing here. But Susan Roos, a key researcher of chronic sorrow, has written a lot about this and arguing that it's non-pathological but persistent. It's often the companion of non-finite loss. And I warmly recommend engaging with studies and books about chronic sorrow. It's been very helpful for me, at least in understanding ecological grief. Then, of course, there's forms of so-called complicated grief going to more to the clini clinical and difficult side, but I'll not go more deeply into it now. So this was quite a lot of terms, um, and I hope that this was understandable enough. When going through these frameworks, I found lots of connections with people's experiences of ecological grief, and I wanted to give you a glimpse of, of those pers perspectives. I'll close with some recommendations by general scholars of non-finite loss, but I think that these are very relevant and useful in relation to ecological grief also. Naming and validating the losses. Normalizing the ongoing nature of the loss. Finding supports and resources. Recognizing the losses, but also identifying what is not lost. It may first feel that everything about something is lost, but there may be something which remains or may be regrown. Allowing for the possibility of meaning making and growth and initiating rituals where none exist. I have lots of history with spirituality and religion. I didn't talk about it really today, although I think that grief work, so to speak, engagement with grief always has a very deep spiritual and existential dimension. But this is coming from the scholars of non-finite loss who also see how important uh, rituals would be. So there is the source also for these recommendations. And with this, I close this brief commentary from Finland with a photo of Finnish swamps, something very dear, dear to us. I'm looking forward for the other, other panelist presentations and hopefully we'll have some time for also Q&A here and at least at the end of the session. So over to you, Susan, and thanks everyone for listening. Thanks, Panu. Um, I don't know if there might be time for one question from the audience. If anyone had something specific they wanted to ask at this point. 
Um, and actually, I, I will ask you one question, um, leaving the rest for the end. Uh, I think it's fair to say, Panu, that you've really emphasized um, recognizing the wide range of different emotions and sort of the, the distinctions among those different kinds of emotions. And you just described, of course, different aspects of grief. I wonder if you could say anything about, um, you know, what, what are the advantages or implications or, you know, what is the need for, um, for recognizing or being a little bit more specific about the kinds of emotions people are, are feeling? Uh, thank you, Susan. That's a great question, which was somehow implicit in my talk, the benefits, but it's very good to be explicit uh, about that. And I think there's several sides to this. Uh, first, we have research about the human mind or body mind, which shows that if we are able to name even roughly uh, the, the emotions or feelings that we are feeling, it's more easier for us to, to deal constructively with the energies in those emotions. So if we notice that, hey, I'm feel, feeling ang angry or, or, hey, this is actually making me feel sad, then we have lots lot more options than if we are just going with the emotional energy flow. But also for social support and recognition, uh, realizing what people are feeling uh, that helps in that also. So, and sometimes some of these words are quite large, like grief, for example. So if we have more nuance about fe feeling a sense of longing, feeling some kind of melancholy or light sadness, there may be all kinds of variations. And then if we think about how to react to the emotions, having a more nuanced vocabulary and understanding, I think can be greatly helpful in, in, in that. So these are some of the aspects why I think it's important there would be more, more of course, but thanks for raising this issue up. Thanks, uh, that, that's very succinct. I think we need to move on to the next speaker, but we'll get to other questions uh, again at the end of the, the panel. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our next speaker, who, Jennifer Uchendu. Um, Jennifer is an eco-feminist, climate justice advocate, and founder of Sati Vibes, which is a youth-led organization driving sustainability advocacy and implementation in Africa. She's an international speaker. I think I first heard her maybe a couple of years ago, um, trainer and youth organizer, and um, very inspirational, I, th I think I can add. Recently, her work has really focused on climate change and mental health, and she's exploring climate emotions in Africa um, or among Africans through research advocacy and community action. She has a master's degree in development studies from the Institute of Development Studies in the UK under the prestigious Chevening Scholarship. She's an alumnus of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership and the Lagos Business School. And she's been awarded a number of fellowships um, under Ashoka, Mandela Washington, Omega Resilience, and Faith for the Planet. Jennifer, nice to see you again. Thank you so much, Susan. Really a pleasure to be back um, in a space like this. And thanks for the opportunity to speak again about eco-anxiety. Um, you know, in a platform where people like Pano and yourself are, you know, also speaking. So I find it so humbling and I'm so honored to be here. Um, I would start my talk today by, you know, saying I would kind of take a slightly different turn from Panu because he's an amazing researcher, done a lot of work on this from academia side. And I think I approach this topic um, as a young woman, an African, and just someone who's always been a youth climate activist and seen the need to explore the mental health implications of climate change in our world, particularly as a young person. And um, for those who do not know about my work, you know, I started running Susti Vibes when I was about 22 in Nigeria, wanting to galvanize young people um, to do work for the planet. It was really from a place of passion, from a place of participation, and that desire for youth leadership in climate action and broader environmental protection conversations. And we started this work with a lot of zeal, a lot of excitement, a lot of passion, you know, cleaning up um, the environment, running a lot of advocacy. And I think by the time we got to year three, we started to feel um, a different pull towards our work. The fact that there was a lot of stress, there was a lot of apprehension and anxiety 
and worried uh, and worry as it were about the work that we did. And it wasn't that we weren't doing enough. It was that we just felt that we felt very powerless, I would say, powerless in the face of the enormity of climate change, powerless in the sense that even as people who were doing this work in Nigeria, we didn't feel like it made any much impact, basically. And I think that pool really started to resonate with us. We, we didn't know what we were experiencing. And this was in 2019, not so much conversations around eco-anxiety was coming up. And I think for us, you know, it was, it was a place where we needed to figure out what was wrong with us, but we didn't know, you know, there was, we didn't know the name eco-anxiety, for example. We didn't realize that there was even a concept like, oh, all of this range of emotions we're feeling was connected to something kind of bigger than us that even young people in other parts of the world were also feeling. And I think for us, it wasn't until, you know, I was fortunate to go um, for my master's in the UK that I got to learn about eco-anxiety and I always talk about that light bulb, you know, effect. Panel earlier spoke about the power of naming and defining these emotions and these feelings. And I think it was really empowering to figure out that there is this body of work and, you know, emerging study about what exactly is this relationship, this indirect exposure to the climate crisis and its impact on young people and children. And the more I learned about eco-anxiety, the more I saw that not much was being said or being explored in our part of the world. And I thought it was ironic, right? Because we experience the impact more when you look at it from a climate justice frame, we are actually more vulnerable to the impact of the crisis. And so, in terms of feelings and negative emotions, we actually experience it more. And so I think that um, did two things for me, it triggered me to say, well, we do need to make a case for eco-anxiety in Africa, explore these emotions, really look at it from a case of climate adaptation, because this is the only way we have to figure out what it means to thrive and cope in um, a world that is you know, plagued with a climate crisis. And I think that motivated me to switch my entire master's thesis to learn about eco-anxiety. And two things that I did was trying to compare the differences in my experience of eco-anxiety as a young woman from Africa and that of my counterparts and young people who were living in Europe um, and in the UK at the time. I think two things that I learned was that my experience of eco-anxiety was very much linked to race, linked to my understanding of power, colonialism and justice. And so I, I and a lot of Africans from our research, and I'll come to that a bit, are feeling a lot of anger, a lot of powerlessness because of the frame of eco-anxiety, because we are feeling not just an indirect exposure, but we're feeling both the indirect and the direct. And what do I mean by that is the fact that it's not just fear that a crisis or an issue or a loss of livelihood can come to you immediately is the fact that this is your reality. Um, in Nigeria, for example, floods are, you know, it's almost like a thing you hope doesn't just happen to you because it could be anyone based on where you live um, in, in the country. So for us, it's that consistent exposure to both the direct and indirect impacts of the climate crisis this on our mental health, on our um, physical health, on our daily livelihoods. And so we always look at it as the environment is about our lives. This is about our future. This is about our present. And so eco-anxiety, it's a bit more substantial for us. It's not just anxiety and it's not just a future anticipation. It's literally a fear and anger you know, a feeling of powerlessness that we sometimes feel very crippled by the complexity, the enormity of the climate crisis, especially when you go down to the roots, right? How did we even get here? Why are we on this side feeling super burdened by this reality that we, don't, we did not particularly cause? And who exactly do we blame? Who do we fight? Who do we hold accountable? And I think that complexity makes it even worse for us. It makes our situation even more precarious because then there's a tendency to be 
even violence, you know, within the confusion and that sort of sense of powerlessness and a lack of agency. Um, that is our experience of eco anxiety. These are the things that I've learned. Um, but I think I had to I had to make a decision to do um, either just kind of break down with the powerlessness of we can't do so much here. Um, the world is just already skewed to our disadvantage. Or do we decide to take action? Um, and what does action look like within the frame of eco anxiety in Africa? I think for us, we decided to then do something called the eco anxiety Africa project, which is um, something that we started um, at Susti Vibes, where we wanted to basically um, explore eco anxiety from an African point of view as young people. We wanted to know or we wanted to make a case for the African experience of eco anxiety because um, when I came into this work, there was a narrative that this is only something experienced by um, the West. And I thought, well, this is crazy because um, we have a lot of people, older people, younger people who are massively impacted by this, who are massively impacted um, by constantly worrying and thinking and grieving, even not just the loss of um, um, their environment, but the loss of their cultures and identity as a result of the climate crisis and how um, I've, I've said it earlier, how just powerless people feel, you know, it's, it's that feeling of powerless where you do not have the resources to fight. You don't even have the resources to cope. So I thought it was really, really, really important that we explore, um, we explore our feelings of um, eco anxiety and also sort of do a deep dive um, as young people um, at Susti Vibe. So the Eco Anxiety Africa project started in 2022 and um, we wanted to basically learn about eco anxiety from a young person's point of view. And I think one thing that um, we've learned so far in the past couple of years has been that it's important to have space for dialogue, whether it's space within a virtual setting, whether it's physical, we need to have conversations about the mental health implications of the climate crisis. We want to know how, you know, these two big issues, these two complex issues um, relate to one another. So coming together within a climate cafe setting, coming together within a space, within a classroom, even within a church or a mosque, I think is really important as a people, whether we're looking at it as a way to build resilience as this summit is about, or we're looking at it as a way to just talk about what what's wrong, it's always really important to name the problem, discuss and reflect on the emotions. And um, I think for us, one project we did um, with a previous speaker on this summit, actually Dr. Bridge Ray, was to explore with our elders, so people who are age 55 and above in Nigeria, to explore what does it mean to be climate distressed in a place like Lagos. And it was really interesting to you know, see what that space did to people. Um, we had elders saying, we've always wanted to have conversations like this, but we've been so crippled and boggled by all of the worries of, you know, the world, all of the worries of living in a developing country that we never have to um, space to talk about the environment, whereas the environment is actually a big part of our lives. Environment is actually our livelihoods, you know, our day to day. Um, one thing we've also learned is that validating climate emotions, you know, is critical for psychological resilience, even now, you know, and I think that speaks to what this summit is about, you know, we're now in the Anthropocene, this is where we are, it's about living with climate change. And validating these climate emotions are really crucial. And a lot of my work has been to look at what that means within power dynamics between government and citizens, parents and children, teachers and pupils. Do we always often have time to express and talk about these emotions? Validate the fact that sometimes young people are feeling completely sad, depressed, you know, because of everything happening. And A, it's normal and it's okay to not pathologize, but it's actually their reality. And in that point in time, this emotion is negative and it needs to be spoken about. And then we are also learning that people need an 
enabling environments to act for you know the climate to act about climate change they need and by enabling environment is really spaces that do the dialogue about climate um, anxiety the validation but also where there's space to express yourself space to for example have a strike become an activist hold governments accountable oftentimes in africa we don't always have spaces like that and i think that cripples and makes you know the the emotions related to eco anxiety even worse um and then we've also learned that these emotions need to be safeguarded and um panu spoke a bit about practical eco anxiety that's also something that we're seeing that you know just presenting with eco anxiety um is a good step in the right direction because it does show that you care and when it's seen in that light it can encourage further action so it means that the emotions need to be safeguarded rather than invalidated or dismissed so it's a question of how do we safeguard eco anxiety for young people and that's a question that we're still you know figuring answers to even as researchers and practitioners um, and then also just to say that one thing we're learning um, particularly for young people is that there is a concept of eco gaslighting and i've seen it a lot within research the fact that oftentimes um whether it's government leaders or people in power you know, make it seem that there's progress, you know, ongoing with the work that they do. There are lofty promises and commitments about what needs to be done and what has been done. And when you really go deep, it's actually all just um, gaslighting as it were. We've seen that that idea, that concept, you know, whether it's greenwashing or whatever it's framed as, can be a very negative trigger um, for eco anxiety, particularly for young people and children. And then finally, is that young people are experiencing um, a body of hope, really. And by burden of hope, it's the fact that constantly, and even I as a young person have heard this severally, the fact that we're being told, well, we're the future of humanity, we're the power, we have the power to change the world, and we can make a difference when it comes to the climate crisis. And again, I constantly ask, how do young people and children in, in the states that we're in, in the places where there's a lot of tokenist participation and youth leadership is, you know, um, frowned upon as it were, how do we, exa how do we exactly um, make this change as leaders? So it, it goes back to questions around agency and resilience for young people. And so to move away from the burden of hope, and I, I think it's just really to flip it on its head, to say you want young people to have hope, then give them opportunities to speak out about how they feel, speak about, uh, about their ideas, and then work with them you know, in ways that are very authentic and you know, support agency. And um, finally, um, I think it will be a disservice if I don't talk about the fact that um, the new frame of thinking about you know, climate impact, particularly in the global south, has been around loss and damage. And loss and damage is great in itself because it helps us see the social injustice of um, the climate crisis. And I think it's really important um, when we talk about it in eco anxiety um, literature, because loss and damage for me and everything I've seen um, doing this work in Nigeria, it's about loss that money would never be able to pay for. It's, it's not about you know, what climate finance can or cannot do. It's about the losses that are um, very difficult to compensate, almost impossible. You know, when a farmer loses his complete livelihood, when people's lives, you know, have, they have to move um, from one place to the other. These are losses that are very much linked to um, eco-anxiety, and it's a real social justice issue that needs to be explored um, even deeply. And so, you know, in all of this work, um, I think what has been really core is that conversations and research about eco-anxiety is emerging, but more of it needs to be done side by side with what's happening in the West, what's happening in the global South. How do we involve more young people into this conversation? Because again, we're the future of humanity, and it's really important that we are at the forefront of conversations like this, especially when it comes to eco-anxiety. There's so much to be learned, so much unanswered questions, but I think ultimately, um, eco-anxiety is helping, helping us see that we need to work together 
we need to redefine our idea of solidarity, especially when it comes to um, climate action as a people. Um, I often say that we're now living in the climate crisis. What do we do um, every day with the work, whether we're exploring emotions, whether it's the technology of climate action, everything that we're doing has to come from a place of psychological resilience, a place of looking at um, looking beyond, you know, the greed, looking beyond that sense of um, just wanting to grow that has led us to this place and looking at ideals in love, ideals in empathy. I think that's how we really build resilience when we think of it as researchers or climate actors. Um, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to more conversations, more questions and answers, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you and over to you, Susan. Thanks so much, Jennifer. I think you have really called our attention to the importance of recognizing that our emotional responses um, exist in a context that is different for different people. And one of those uh, differences is between anxiety about what might happen in the future and fear based on what is already happening, what is already being experienced. Um, but very importantly also uh, that these emotions are influenced by the by the social context and how we see other people reacting, including um, perhaps a lack of response or lack of sufficient response by those in charge. Um, so we do have one question that asks you maybe about um, your personal experience of this. So given uh, the degree of environmental injustice that exists, um, you know, and not just around the world, but also certainly specifically in America and in, and in uh, Canada, um, where an understanding of environmental problems is often um, comes from a particular perspective that doesn't incorporate uh, the experience of so many people. How do you personally continue to do work in this field when it's filled with people whose experiences are so different from yours? Thank you so much, Suzanne. I think that's a very important question. It comes up a lot for me. Um, I do want to have more people who look like me. And Susan, I said this in Vancouver, talk about this work. You know, we exist, but oftentimes our voices are, you know, suppressed or, you know, not seen as important or not regarded as really important. Um, and I think it's a responsibility for all of us in spaces like this to find more of those voices and amplify them, more of those voices and support them. Um, oftentimes our experience of you know, mental health and climate change is very different from that in the West, but it's the fact that we're all in the same sort of ocean of problem, albeit in different boats. And so it's a question of solidarity, it's a question of helping to support and amplify these voices. And also, you know, I think for most people, there's the tendency, very tempting tendency to just give up, you know, to just be powerless. And I think exploring these emotions, doing this research, has given me a sense of hope even, has given me a renewed sense of purpose to say, the more I dig into this climate emotions, the more I see ways that we can support people. And remember, I started by saying, I see this as a way for climate adaptation. You know, This is not just for some research. This is the way we're gonna cope and thrive in the climate crisis, whereas Africans, whether it's people in vulnerable community, if we can, hack and really you know, empower ourselves from a psychological point of view, then we build the re needed resilience to take action. Um, and that's the way I see it. And that has what, that's what has given me inspiration and hope to sort of continue this work. Thank you. Thank you. That's such a great um, specific concrete example of, of the need to, to acknowledge and, uh, and talk about our emotions. Um, we'll move now to the last speaker, Jyoti Mishra. Uh, Dr. Mishra is a cognitive neuroscientist and founder of the Neural Engineering and Translation Labs at uh, University of California in San Diego, where she also co-leads the University of California Climate Change and Mental Health Initiative. She conducts research across the lifespan in both local and global communities and emphasizes solutions that can help address these important issues, including how to sustain psychological health and well-being, and how to be resilient in the context of climate change. Um, her, her work and research on climate change and mental health has been widely featured in the mass media, and she has a recent children's book called The Little Brain, discussing resilient learning among children. 
So um, Dr. Misha, really a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Susan, and uh, such an honor to be part of this amazing panel. Thank you for very uh, enlightening talk by Panu and very inspiring comments by Jennifer. And um, and let me see, let me share my screen over here. And um, yeah, I would like to tell you about uh, my journey in this in this field and and what we're up to at the present moment. Um, as we as we uh, all know, we're at the point of crisis because we live in a limited and interconnected resource system where our climate system determines and is um, in a feedback loop with our natural resources, our human security, as well as our societal stability. Um, at the same time, uh, we also acknowledge that our health is highly interconnected, which was very nicely laid out in this um, mental health um, report by Eco America that Dr. Clayton authored with other um, and knowledge stakeholders in the field, really showing that mental health, physical health, as well as community health related to violence and crime and instability are all highly interconnected with each other. And so in this regard, um, here in California, we see every day, um, especially uh, in the summers and now as an annual fire season, that our local climate is really changing um, dramatically on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, over the last 30 years or so, the extent of forest fires has increased, and this is directly linked to um, the um, the warming that we are seeing from climate change. And as the previous speakers have acknowledged, this has because we are living in the Anthropocene and the curves of the areas burned in the, um, the Western US forest fires directly overlap with the warming that we're seeing from year to year. And overall, there's been a thousand percent increase in, in wildfires. Currently, future climate projections are also exposing more land and more people to deadly heat. In this context um, and in this backdrop, uh, we as individuals are thinking every day about how do we make change. And um, in this regard, I'm thankful to my son, who was in first grade, came home uh, with a penny drive. And when I asked him what it's for, he said, um, it's for um, people who have suffered from the wildfires, especially the deadliest wildfire that happened in California in 2018, the campfire. Um, there was a phone number on the penny drive that he was doing. And I got um, to talk with the people who were organizing the drive all over California. And this was in, in relation to California's deadliest wildfire that happened in 2018 in Butte County. And that's where my journey into looking at um, the effects of climate change uh, quantitatively, uh, that's where my journey actually started. Um, when we think about global action, we think global and uh, we act local. And so in my backdrop is um, California. And what was happening in the time at, at, at that time was that we're seeing um, the reports that th this campfire was one of the worst disasters that's ever been seen. And the governor at the time, Jerry Brown, said, so it was so devastating, I don't really have the words to describe it. It really does look like a war zone. So we wanted to harness this uh, kind of anecdotal evidence and, and make sure that the word is heard and um, that we have more quantitative methods um, uh, around it. And, at, and uh, these are stats around, around the wildfire showing how deadly it was. And indeed, it, it still is um, the deadliest wildfire that California has seen. Uh, what I want to point out that these uh, fires, as well as other natural disasters, uh, are affecting already vulnerable communities. Uh, the graphic here shows the health outcome scores, and the lower the score means the area has lower access to healthcare re resources, 
and is socioeconomically less well off than other areas. And the encircled region is where this wildfire happened. Now, California experiences wildfires in many of these zones, but most of the time, these are communities that are already vulnerable and burdened by socioeconomic and healthcare um, shortages. And so we think about other things that are happening in an environment. So this is a from a later fire that happened in similar regions, showing how we are uh, really putting um, exponential burden on our communities when we think about uh, stressors like the pandemic in this case, and then um, the climate crisis coming on top of that. So we took on a study of uh, about 700 people in this zone of the wildfires. We looked at people who were directly exposed to the fires, which means they were personally impacted in terms of property loss or family injury and so on, versus people who were indirectly impacted. That is, the fires happened in their communities, but they did not suffer from personal loss versus those who were not exposed to the fires. In this case, they were a gender and age match and socioeconomically matched, but never exposed to these same fires. And what we find here is shown by this graphic that there was three times the pre prevalence of mental health disorders such as post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety as well as depression was also high and most uh, prominently seen in individuals who are directly exposed. Beyond this, we worked in these communities, we've continued to work in these communities and looked at this concept that is more um, complex than uh, putting it under one psychological or psychiatric bucket like PTSD or anxiety or depression. And we now refer to it as climate change trauma that then goes on to impact other aspects of mental health and as well as brain health, which is um, an expertise that I bring to the field. This is what we learned in terms of impacted cognition uh, in that people who are directly exposed as well as those who are indirectly exposed on average had a poor cognition, especially in the context of being able to process interference and distractions in our, in our environment. And how we think about it is that um, many a times when we suffer from trauma, many things can appear threatening and therefore we're unable to uh, dissociate what is goal relevant information versus what may be irrelevant and interfering. At the same time, in um, new work, we've also shown that this can further impact long-term decision-making, our ability to make decisions that give us cumulative gains over the long-term um, in the face of short-term losses. And instead, people tend to make more um, impulsive decisions when we're under the stress of such, um, uh, such a crisis. And uh, what is worrying in this case is that we find these effects to be chronic. They don't happen just acutely, which can be like a simple adaptation response when you're trying to move away from a disaster. These effects are actually observed chronically six months to a year, even after the disaster has taken place. And um, of course, more work needs to be done into looking at what happens when we're suffering uh, from these disasters on, um, on a year-to-year -year basis. Going further, we work with community stakeholders to look at even aspects of brain function. So this is um, a brain wave recordings. And what you see are these intense patterns of activity on the surface of the head that are recorded from the brain recordings. And again, the patterns deviate in individuals who are exposed versus not exposed. What I want you to take out from this is that the pattern in the directly exposed individuals appears much more intense, which is showing a, a much more hyper aroused state of the brain, which is what happens when we are constantly in the psychological mode of being under threat. And we're constantly um, really you know, gauging whether our environment around us can be threatening to us or not. 
So from this, um, we've gone on to adopt the term of climate trauma, which tends to define the complex mental health sequelae from climate change accelerated weather events that we are seeing. And um, climate trauma that was first coined by Woodbury talks about also is appropriate because it talks about the fact that we're not separate from the earth, its ecosystems and its climate. We're actually both the problem and can be the solution. And this is something I'll transition to in the next portion. Um, in this regard, we are the traumatizer. We live in the, the Anthropocene. And at the same time, we are the traumatized. What affects the planet affects us. And this is something that our previous speaker brought, uh, brought forth as well, that it represents a form of trauma that supersedes or intersects with all other kinds of trauma. It offers another layer of disadvantage for communities that are already facing the worst of climate change that are already very vulnerable given their socioeconomic and healthcare um, um, resources that are available to them. So transitioning here, um, Dr. Clayton asked that we reflect a little bit on what we can do in this context. How do we think about um, climate resilience? Our work in this regard has also shown in these uh, same populations that we've studied um, what can be protective of from mental ill being. So what protects and uh, continue in, in this context when these disasters are happening, what supports well-being? And we find that um, individuals who are older in age are less affected. Individuals who have um, a psychological re resilience belief system that I will bounce back from um, any challenge that comes at me are more uh, resilient and, and maintain their well-being, have lesser of the symptoms of uh, PTSD, depression, and anxiety that we uh, looked at. And at the same time, a healthy lifestyle, individuals who um, are able to have a physically active lifestyle in this context also showed lesser depressive symptoms. And mindfulness can be a very important um, a protective factor as well with the highest significant effect size for depression and anxiety in terms of being protective. So these are some pers personal traits that we looked at that can be um, protective in this context. Um, then with community psychologists, in this case, we also went on to look at family and community ties and showed that, that this kind of a community that is uh, really connected with each other and has a sense of, that people are connected to each other and can reach out to each other for a sense of support, that's very beneficial uh, for being um, protective in this context and facilitating mental health resilience. And what keeps us inspired and in continuing to do this work is that our communities themselves, the ones that are suffering, are the ones that are leading to nature-based solutions. In this case, we're working with um, programs like the ecotherapy program that helps to re-engage individuals um, in a positive connection with the environment, a connection that they've actually lost given the fires, and how do we find this connection back with the environment? And so this is an ecotherapy and eco-mindfulness session that, that happened. And this is um, an ongoing um, effort where the uh, Chico State tends to provide these opportunities um, to more than 5,000 people on a yearly basis. And um, this happens in the context of eco stewardship in terms of rebuilding the ecological environment around us. And it, in, in that sense, when we think about and acknowledge climate trauma, we are people who can be part of the solution in terms of both our self healing and in terms of protecting the environment around us. So this community continues to inspire me to do this work. Um, and this is a quote uh, that is apt for this region that says, I survived because the fire inside me burned brighter than the fire around me. And with that, we do need broader scale solutions. And when we think about mental health, why it's important for us as scientists to connect with policymakers and to public communication, 
is that we need to convert this evidence into collective action and um, bring more resources, especially to our most uh, vulnerable communities. In, in that regard, there are, there are steps that are being taken, such as uh, greater resources for the firefighter communities. And we need to really upscale the work that's being done um, in, in this region, as was a quote from the Californian Prescribed Fire Council lead. So with that, I'm going to end. And this is a framework for climate resilience that we think about. It's a three-pillared framework where we think about mitigation and building up the resources for green energy. We also think about adaptation in terms of helping communities that have been already been impacted to adapt to the um, uh, to the current um, status and as well as continue to adapt as we will be facing more of these environmental disasters. But, but most importantly, what we're looking at is complete social transformation where we will achieve um, really strong support in terms of um, uh, the public and policymakers to continue to um, uh, continue with climate action and uh, take strong steps um, to help us get out of the climate crisis. And this involves climate education for everyone that includes the psychological aspects and acknowledging the psychological aspects, social connection amongst their communities um, and being able to uh, provide them not only, not only the resources, but also the knowledge that we have, um, coalition building. And so not being just in our a uh, specific discipline of eco chambers. So here, this is a very nice panel where we are talking with people from very different disciplines and um, I'm inspired to learn from everyone. And of course, long-term sustainable policy making where we're able to let go of what we're doing in the short term and able to let go of the short-term gains for uh, long-term sustainable solutions. So with that, I will end and with this last slide, and I look forward to the discussion. Great, Jyoti. Thank you so much for that that really fascinating research. And I would I would love to have a, just a personal discussion with you about that. Um, but but for the panel, I'm really pleased that you ended on that sort of positive note about thinking about resilience and what we can do to uh, to promote it. At, especially at both an individual and a systemic level. Um, I want to try and get to, we're getting some interesting questions coming in, so I want to try and get to as many of them as possible. And um, let me encourage all of the panelists to maybe turn their video cameras back on if they would. Um, the first question, which was posed to Panu, but I actually think all of you may have some, uh, some possible response to this. Have you noticed, um, uh, anything maybe that suggests that a uh, spiritual practice or or religious beliefs can be a source of resilience. So are there differences in eco-anxiety um, between people who do have a strong sort of religious uh, tradition and those um, those who do not? Uh, Pano, do you want to maybe start? Uh, yes, I can kick us off. And warm thanks to Jennifer and Jyoti for the presentations. Very glad to be here with, with you. And uh, my own observations, this is partly objective and partly subjective, uh, is that for many people with a spiritual worldview, uh, it has been slightly easier to encounter some of the severity of the ecological crisis. So I see some aspects of what might be called existential resilience, for, for example, here. But then I also see, for example, among Christians, um, much reluctance and resistance to encountering the real a deep severity of the crisis. So, so it, it seems an interesting thing that on on one one hand they move towards it, but then there's a sort of la layer where the fundamental beliefs sort of make it difficult for people to accept how bad the situation actually is. So, just some comments from my perspective. Yeah. Do do either of the other of you, Jennifer and Jyoti, do you have any thoughts about this? 
Um, personally, I've not looked at um, a religious, particular religious affiliation in the research that we've done. Um, at the same time, we do have evidence that a sense of mindfulness and present moment awareness then can, that can sometimes be related to spirituality and as well as extended religion, religious practices can be beneficial for sure. Yeah, um, thanks Jyoti. I could just add to say, I mean, a recent research that we've just done um, with elders in Nigeria and young people, um, we, we saw a lot of that come up in terms of spirituality as um, a source of, I would say almost climate defense. And I think climate defense can be in both ways. So some people use that idea of spirituality and re religion as a defense to not care or to say, well, you know, we have some higher power that can support and protect us. But some other people are using that as a sense of inspiration to say, well, we, you know, have this responsibility to protect the earth. And so we need to endure suffering, uh, you know, and just kind of protect the environment, whatever it takes. So I think there are just levels to the idea of climate defense that we're seeing, but there's so much that I think can be researched and found out, you know, from that relationship, but there's definitely something there. Thanks. Yeah, clearly. I mean, religion is obviously very complex and it includes those the belief system, but all the, also the social identity, um, which can in many cases be a barrier. Um, I think a, a good follow-up question to that is um, relating to the, your, your, your discussion, Jennifer, of the work with elders in Nigeria. And one attendee asked about a kind of a comparison of elder responses uh, in Nigeria and in the US where um, some evidence that older people are having less PTSD, depression, anxiety, it looked like from Jyoti's uh, research, whereas in, in Nigeria, the elders were, were very aware of the threats to their culture and their identity. Um, can you discuss maybe what those, what explains those kinds of differences, or is that a fair way of talking about it? Yeah, that's a really good question, and I think that also pretty much aligns with the work that Dr. Brits Ray did with um, elders in New Orleans, um, you know, post the um, crisis and, you know, the earthquakes and whatnot. I do see that it's, it can be cultural in terms of what the context is like. Um, for us in Nigeria, we've always looked at crisis as it, the way it impacts our culture and immediate way of living. And, and because that is, you know, the way we've always approached any form of crisis, not just, you know, the environment or the climate related crisis, it, do, it does make sense for it to translate also, because it's the way we live, we're very sort of communal, community centric, so you'd always think of how does this affect, you know, the broader system, our culture, our identity, you know, what does it mean to leave the place where you were born, you know, the land that you're connected to and all of that. So I think it's very cultural and not necessarily a thing of the people. It's about how that culture, you know, translates and sees crisis and resilience um, as it were. Um, at least that has been my experience just from kind of looking at New Orleans versus um, the elders in Lagos. Yeah. Yeah, Jyoti, did you have any more thoughts about that? And based on your experience or your research? Yeah, I think um, the related work that we've done, uh, not particularly just looking at climate, but about elderly cognition, as well as um, brain uh, function and health, what we've learned is that um, there's this construct of wisdom that also develops with age. And it is um, actually inversely related to the construct of loneliness. And so the idea that we can feel lonely in a crowd um, happens more in youth and that distress is reduced over time. And we are, as, as uh, the more um, older we get, we see that there's this construct of wisdom and this construct of uh, that also directly ties with resiliency systems um, builds over time and age, and that may contribute to the protective factors that we're seeing. That's great. And I love the idea of wisdom. Um, 
Uh, as Jennifer mentioned briefly, she and I were both just at the Positive Psychology Conference where there were, when, when they said we want to talk about climate change at the Positive Psychology Conference, I was a little surprised that there was a real emphasis on, you know, human strengths and how can those help us in, um, in responding to climate change and that idea that um, wisdom is something that in many cases, uh, uh, I wouldn't even begin to try to define it, but it is something that maybe develops as you get older. Um, but one of the uh, one of the attendees today wanted to question this idea of resilience, and this is something I think we also heard uh, at our recent conference, which is um, there's a downside to talking about resilience. Uh, and and this uh, this attendee commented that as a person who is navigating a great deal of complex trauma. Um, there's a fatigue associated with having to be resilient. Is it okay to just um, kind of feel your bad feelings and not focus on being strong and overcoming the challenges? Uh, you know, what do you what do you all think? And maybe I'm going to start with you about um, you know, is there a place for uh, accepting those negative emotions? Is that okay, or what is the downside of that? Mm. Yes, thanks for the person who raised this up. And I think we need to critically discuss what we mean with resilience. And is resilience seen only in those persons who themselves feel resilient or strong? So what's the role of the self-evaluation here? And there's a lot of brave people in, in the world who find a way to survive for, for tomorrow using various kinds of adaptation, sometimes wisdom and the methods may be quite diverse. So uh, I think we need a concept which uh, talks about this ability to adapt and go on. And resilience is one part, one important part of this spectrum, but there's also other things and this is linked to them. Uh, sometimes binary between positive and negative emotions. And just to mention one example, I, I'm with those people who see that fear is actually needed and true courage is the ability to feel both fear and anti-courage and uh, not just uh, thinking that you are uh, totally above all fear, for example. So it's this, this kind of openness also to the so-called negative in emotions, which I think is linked to uh, resilience in a very deep sense. Yeah, Jennifer, I wonder if you have any perspectives on, on the downside of uh, of emphasizing resilience? Well, I think that question is really, really interesting because even just in my personal experience of you know, doing work around eco-anxiety, so I see it always as a spectrum, right? So it's the times where there would be this sort of bad negative emotions and there's times where there could be good emotions where they're feelings of joy and hope so it's saying we would not minimize or reduce or completely go over the bad side because we always want to be in the good side right so it's holding space for both emotions i think that's what makes um, a balanced ecosystem you know if it's possible and i think if we look at resilience from that place so you're not moving to the other side where you're completely always strong you know, have the agency, but it's recognizing that there are times where you will feel weak, you will need that sense of community, you will need that sense of hope, and hope comes from, you know, inspiration, and I think it's it's healthy, I would say, you know, to feel bad sometimes, and then feel good, you know, and oxalate really means what it means to be resilient, acknowledging and knowing the times where, well, we are down at this point, but we want to get, you know, to the other side, but there's nothing wrong with being down, you know, sometimes. So that's the way I see it. It might be simplistic, but, you know, it has helped basically. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're both highlighting that, you know, and, and the research supports us that that we do experience these complex emotions, which include positive and negative emotions at the same time. So we don't have to feel that in order to have hope, we have to suppress uh, the anxiety. Uh, Jyoti, did you have any um, any either results from your research or just your personal experience with the, the campfire survivors that talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, as a neuroscientist, the perspective that I bring is that 
um, our brains are coded in oscillations, which means we are waves, real, literally waves that go up and down from peaks to troughs all the time. Uh, while that may be a, a metaphor, uh, again, going back to some of the research that we've done um, with wisdom is that we see that um, individuals who are showing um, the wiser construct are responding to um, the positive emotions. Their, the brain responses to the positive emotions are stronger and faster than to the negative emotions and the contrast when we're not feeling that way. And what's interesting is that the part of the brain that responds is um, this part called the temporal parietal junction that is very important in our ability to relate to each other. And what that means to me, uh, without making too much interpretation of brain data, is that um, the, par the, the, the times in life when we are feeling burnt out and feeling alone are the times when we're also needing more connection with others, more community, um, more of wanting to do this together and not alone. And um, I would really want to take that as a message and it's also helped me in my own life is uh, when we're feeling that loneliness and sense of non-resilience, um, it's a signal for our bodies and minds to reach out which is why um, collective action is very important. That's great. And I, I think there's a, a theme that's been a little bit implicit, but which you just made more explicit, which is that these emotional experiences are not just um, individual experiences, but they really can have this impact of uh, connecting us to others, as well as, of course, the connecting to others will impact our emotional experience. And um, this leads me to a, a slightly different question, which has to do with education. Um, uh, many of us have some experience, all of us have some experience with education and you know, environmental education is certainly um, an important topic and an important way people are thinking about how do we reach out, uh, especially to young people and give them more information and more tools to cope with climate change. Uh, so one attendee asked about, um, the sort of uh, controversy or, uh, over whether it's okay for teachers to elicit or even enable, let's say, negative emotions in the classroom. You know, is it okay to let your students talk about climate grief and anxiety? Um, uh, and, um, you know, is it the teacher's responsibility just to focus on the positive side? Um, uh, Panu, maybe um, I, I think this is closest to your area. Do you want to start us off with that question? Yeah, def definitely. I've been working a lot with that that team, and one of the visuals that I showed was from an article called "Eco Anxiety and Environmental Education," and there I'm reviewing research and advocating for a three-step model, which is briefly. First, I think that educators have the ethical responsibility to publicly recognize that the ecological crisis arouses all kinds of feelings and emotions in people. So the educator, as in a position of power, I think has this moral obligation at least to give validation and recognition. Then if there is any chance, I'm advocating for discussing ecological emotions with the students, or even better, the third step, doing some kind of embodied activities around them. But not all ed educators and not all places in the world have possibilities for, for this. So there's lots of contextual factors which have a role here. But we are also dealing in the industrial world and all its uh, all the places where it has influence uh, with the very old a distinction between reason and emotion and the false belief that reason is always better than, than emotion. And this really affects teachers, for example. They may have reluctance towards emotions and especially reluctance towards the so-called negative emotions. So it's a complex issue. And one website I'm recommending is existentialtoolkit.com existentialtoolkit.com, an international network of justice-oriented environmental educators who also deal with emotions. And, and either of the other of you, do you want to add anything about education? 
Um, I would just like to add that I completely agree with what Pana said, and also that we do need to acknowledge these emotions and normalize them in the classroom and also label them as Pana's talk really, um, you know, nicely laid out that figuring out which emotion we're feeling uh, can lead us to um, to change, a uh, specific change in our own personal context. And at the same time, uh, the teachers in our school classrooms need to have um, a toolkit uh, and beyond that, more education themselves on how to deal with these emotions and how to actually turn that distress into action, something that we're trying with our educational initiatives at the University of California. There's just a lot of climate education that's factual, that's telling us what climate change is about and what it's doing, but less so on um, how to convert distress to action or how to think about climate hope. And really we need to engage in that kind of education simultaneously. And I think somebody in the chat pointed out that um, ecological stewardship um, and eco-mindfulness, these are really something that has to be knitted within that same framework. And uh, for those of you, some of you may be aware of this, but um, Maria Oyala in Sweden has been doing a lot of work on education about climate change. So if you're particularly interested, I encourage you to look into that. Um, let me see how many more of these questions we have time to get to. Uh, one, uh, one attendee asks, is it possible, getting back to the idea of wisdom, to um, kind of be mindful of different traditions of wisdom and, uh, and unite these, um, especially across the major religions? Um, is there a way of uh, of uniting different, different maybe religious or cultural conceptions of wisdom um, does anybody know of researchers or initiatives that are trying to to do this um, in a way that will, you know, help the again different religious perspectives come together to enhance cooperation globally? That's a challenging question. I don't know if anyone has a response. Um, my only response to that is that I'm related to Dr. V. Ramanathan. He um, is someone who's been really inspiring in my own field. Um, he's, he's a climate scientist who discovered um, greenhouse gases and has really been taking on a lot of policy efforts. But one of the things that climate scientists like him have gone on to do, and him especially, is um, work with the Vatican. And that being a, a really um, strong, um, you know, sort of a loudspeaker for, uh, you know, religious um, uh, education, religious awareness to the Catholic community. And similarly, there's been work that's being done in the uh, Tibetan community led by um, statements, med, uh, statements made by the Dalai Lama. So we, it's really important that um, the leaders of our different religions are aligned with the views on the climate crisis and then are able to disseminate it to um, different, uh, you know, within the different communities, because a lot of people, frankly, that's how we listen. We listen less to data and more to our own belief systems and our opinions and our religious leaders need to be part of that conversation. Yeah, yeah and the, go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, I just wanted to add to say that it should be okay to have different forms of knowing in terms of people's different belief systems. But what we need is to have sort of like a common language. So rather than uniting, you know, the different religions, and I, I would say there are a whole lot more than five, uh, but rather than uniting the religion, but just having a faith-based approach to talking about spirituality and, you know, climate emotions, that would be a better frame that more people can immediately relate to. Because I think with these conversations, it's just recognizing that there's diversity and strength, you know, within that differences of belief system. But we have one planet, we have sort of one connection to the environment, and that is something that is relatable across human experience, despite your religion um, or lack of it even. So that's a good way to look at it, I would say. Okay, our next question. Um, 
really gets at uh, trying to move beyond a Western perspective uh, to think about the experiences of marginalized peoples, indigenous peoples whose world, who have already had to cope with uh, frequent severe environmental changes, let's say. Um, and uh, so thinking about what eco-anxiety looks like, both from the developed world perspective and from these uh, additional perspectives, can you think about a future without eco-anxiety? Does that make sense? Or is that is that naive? Uh, kind of a provocative question. What is your response to that? Well, and perhaps I can I can I can start. Of course, it partly depends on what we mean with eco-anxiety, but uh, I don't see any near future without ecological grief, at least. And I don't mean that it would be, you know, standard intense grief, as you already said, there's oscillations and fluctuations and also in grief and sadness processes, but there's going to be so many changes ongoing that we really need uh, the creative energies in, in grief and, and sadness. So that's going to stay, stay with us. And in one way, the situation is going to be more even in the sense that uh, we privileged people in the Western world also uh, we will start, start to feel more of the direct impacts. So this, this situation where it's been more of a shock that the world has so much injustice and problems, this is changing rapidly all around the world also. Yeah, what I'd add to that is that there's research out there, especially from political science, showing that eco-anxiety can actually help to generate more climate action and more opinions for ecological change. So up to a certain extent, uh, it is um, a positive emotion in terms of what it does towards um, collective action and policymaking and for um, better policymaking. Uh, of course, the, the chronic nature and the um, you know, the severity uh, is is not not good for us. And that's why we're having these um, community discussions and hopefully more resources to help people with that. But uh, I think in some ways, eco-anxiety can channel more action. Absolutely, I agree. I think, you know, just to end with saying, Maybe what we don't need, we don't need a world without eco-anxiety, but we need a world where we've safeguarded eco-anxiety and, you know, found ways to transform it into hope, you know, and action. All of those things, you know, sound very inspirational and hopeful, but I think that's what we need. That's why spaces like this are helpful. How do we safeguard these climate emotions where it's useful and helpful, you know, to build agency for ourselves? Wonderful. And thanks for linking us back to action as well. Um, I've just, I think, time for one more question, which I there may be a fairly brief yes or no answer to, but one uh, attendee raised the question of um, uh, neurodivergent people um, and people with autism. Um, do you know of any research that has to do with the way in which they might be processing these kinds of emotional responses to climate change? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing a no. Um, so that would be a, a, an opportunity for future researchers to look into. Um, so I think it's time for us to wrap up and you all get to go and have your lunch now. The next panel, which starts in an hour, is also very closely related to this. So I uh, hope everybody will be able to come back and listen into that. And thanks, thanks for your attendance and for your questions. And thanks again to the panelists for their really thoughtful and helpful comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. That was amazing. I learned so much. I'm so grateful for all of the work all of you've done. It's just been incredible to be part of the audience and listen to the complexity and the honesty of what you brought, um, including the downside of emphasizing resilience. Um, I think my biggest takeaway is that emotional experience is not individual experience, right? And so I think that sort of um, really is is what this this whole summit is about, which is we're connecting the personal to the community to the planetary, um, and how th there is an open flow system between these three identities, right? 